God is faithful, isn't he? Amen. Amen. He always meets our needs. Uh, I'm pretty sure Pastor Bill sent out the giving statements to everybody. Um, it really, our kids were excited to get them to see how much they gave that year. And uh, 
you know, Bill and I got ours and we opened it up. I opened it up and I was like, wow, God is good. Amen. Amen. I mean, it was pretty close to what our income was when we first got married and our giving. So, I mean, God is extremely faithful. Amen. This church is extremely faithful to giving tithes and offerings. We have such a faithful church. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for your goodness. I thank you, Jesus, that you meet our every need. You even meet our wants, Father, and our desires, Lord. You care about everything. I thank you, Jesus, that you continue to help us dream and to grow, Father, and to trust in you to be the supplier of all things, Father. We love you, Jesus. In your mighty name we pray, amen.
Does anybody, was anybody, does anybody here remember about a year, maybe a little bit more than a year ago, um, thought I had another job lined up, right? And then the, the Lord ended up having me stay where I'm at, right? So Friday, um, the, the owner of the company that I work for, pulled me in the office with my my immediate boss the general manager and uh he actually he is he owns five companies total um he actually he, he his plan now <laughs> is he pulled me out of where i'm at at mea put me in charge of the finances for his other four companies yeah the, yeah so I mean, it's a big learning curve, that's for sure. But um, I, I was actually talking to Pastor Bill. I, it blew my mind. Uh, this week, I literally ran payroll for everybody that works for him <laughs> across all the all four production companies. Uh, so it, it blew my mind. I, I was thinking about that. And... Um, uh, there's a phrase in Ephesians uh, 1 6 it says to the praise of the glory of his grace <laughs> and so I was I still can't wrap my mind around this I know you know nobody knows you like you know you I know me and I know that naturally I am naturally speaking not a good worker Naturally speaking, I know me. I know who, what I'm like by myself. I'm as lazy as can be. <laughs> I, left to myself, if I didn't have to answer to anybody, I'm as lazy as lazy can be. But the fact is, God's grace opened doors that work ethic alone would never do and uh, what I'm trying to say is all of that everything everything that God's done so far in, in supposedly secular world which is not <laughs> not for a Christian it's not a secular it's not secular all, everything that God's done for me he's the only thing I can say I've done in any of that is just not shut any doors Right. What I mean by that is I didn't shut the door by being lazy at work. I didn't shut the door by disrespecting my boss at work. I didn't shut the door by doing things when I should be working. It didn't shut the door by holding back the tithe because we needed it. Didn't shut the door by, you know what I'm saying? There are certain things, certain things that God let, sets in place in Scripture to prosper. But it really is not that you're you're doing something to make yourself prosper you're just stepping out of the way you're walking with him he's doing the work you're just keeping step right what i'm trying to say is that anything that he's done for any one of his people is not exclusive to them he'll do the same for you he prospered one person by grace through faith, he'll do it for you. By grace through faith. He healed somebody by grace through faith, he'll heal you. Same way. All you got to do is make sure you're not shutting the door. Does that make sense? Is that, is that okay, Pastor? Okay. So, all praise to his grace. <laughs> It's kind of a modern day Joseph story, really. Thank God you didn't have to go through a dungeon season, but maybe some of your life felt that way prior to this. And just like Joseph, who kept Egypt from going under in a famine, who knows if you didn't keep your company from going under in the last couple of years? A lot of companies closed. I truly believe that 
not in an arrogant way. But companies are blessed to have tithing people working for them. And I really believe that the Lord will, will prosper a business simply because there's tithing people there. Because it's part of the covenant. If that's the funnel that God is currently using to supply your need, then it has to prosper. That's the truth. Hmm. You have more to add to that? Or? <laughs> Some things I'm just not at liberty to say, you know? I can't really give... I'll just say, you know, we just, year-end stuff is this time of the year. And, you know, 2020, the Lord told us to get some things in order in the house, beginning part of 2020. And, honestly, I remember having a conversation with the Lord when he said to do that. And I thought, at the time, I didn't think, I was like, what was out of order? He said, get some things in order. I didn't know what was out of order. And then through investigation and things like that, you know, it was just better ways to do things that we were doing, you know, as far as like managing offering and bookkeeping and things like that. There was better ways to do it and getting CPAs involved, finding out where we were doing things wrong and tweaking things and getting things in order. Well, because of that, you know, there's, there's databases that are in place now where you can see data that you couldn't see before. And so looking back from 2014 to current, at the amount of what the Lord has done inside of Cornerstone in that seven years, I'm just talking like from like a financial standpoint, number numbers standpoint, it truly is amazing. And to look at the numbers means, you know, if there's X amount of dollars that came here, that means that 10 times that came into your households. So as, as mind-boggling as, as, a, as a final number can be for the last seven, seven years, to think ten times that came through your hands, our God is good. Amen. Our God is good. In a time, you know, from, from 2020 on, there's businesses and churches that have closed all over this nation, and 20 and 21 has been more prosperous here than previous years. Because God is faithful, and he's worthy of all praise. And when we sing songs like, there is none like you, there is literally no, no one like our God. There is no one, no provision like our God's provision. There's no peace like the peace that comes from the throne room of God. There's no peace, with, or no peace that comes from like there comes from, you know, that right relationship with God. And, and worshiping in his presence, he is faithful. It's a good God. Amen? All right, give somebody some love before the kids are dismissed, huh? Have a seat. All right, let's go ahead and open up in prayer tonight. Father, I just thank you for your goodness, Lord. I thank you for your presence here tonight. 
Lord, I pray that you would use me, Lord, that you would speak through me, that your words would be what come out of my mouth. Father, that you would have your way tonight. Prepare our hearts, Lord, that we would receive exactly what you have for us. We give you all the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> all right, so Reader's Digest put out an article this year of some of the most ridiculous, real excuses that people gave to get out of work. You ready for it? Okay. First one, an employee couldn't make it to work because they got stuck in the blood pressure machine at the grocery store and couldn't get out. Those things do get tight. An employee couldn't make it to work because someone glued her doors and windows shut so she couldn't leave the house to come to work. I'd like to know what kind of glue that person used. An employee couldn't make it to work because she was experiencing traumatic stress from a large spider found in her home and had to stay home to deal with it. I don't know, I'm kind of siding with this employee, spiders. And my favorite one, an employee couldn't make it to work that day because they woke up in a good mood and they didn't want to ruin it. <laughs> excuses, excuses. We've all got them and we've all used them. A wise person once said, excuses are like armpits. Everyone has them and they usually all stink. <laughs> Please don't let that be the only thing you, rem you remember from this message. Okay, so, and do you know that there are websites on the internet that will help you generate an excuse if you need one? It's true. You can type in the kind of excuse that you need and it generates one for you. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm not giving the website. I'm not giving the website, Shannon. But there is also a website where you can buy a doctor's note from a licensed physician for only $14.99. That's a steal. That is a steal. Crazy, right? Crazy. At least $30. The truth is, we all make excuses. From getting out of that lunch date to why we didn't finish the job we were given on time. But nowhere are the excuses more evident than when we hear the call of God on our lives. And for one reason or another, we just can't bring ourselves to listen or accept that God wants us. We can't believe that God wants to use us. Or we just don't want to be bothered by the requirements or the sacrifices that God might be asking us to make. So we make excuses to God. And we've gotten so deep into the habit of explaining why we can't do something that it never occurs to us that this isn't right. Yep. When God's word tells us to do something, we're to obey it, Amen. not make excuses about why we can't. Amen. The famous evangelist Billy Sunday put it like this, an excuse is the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. Yes. Excuse is the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. In other words, it looks like a good reason on the outside, but at the heart of it, it's really a lie. That's why Benjamin Franklin said, he that is good for making excuses is seldom good for anything else. You know, excuses are nothing new. They've been around since the beginning of mankind. You know who I'm talking about. The very first excuse <laughs> is found in Genesis chapter 3. What happened? Adam ate that forbidden fruit. Then when God confronted him about it, he came up with an excuse. Genesis 3.12. The man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. She made me do it. The blame was shifted to Eve. And what did Eve have to say? Verse 13. The Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me. She replied, that's why I ate it. And just like that, the blame game was born. Both Adam and Eve tried to make excuses. And from that day on, down to the present time, 
People have been making excuses whenever they're faced with consequences, activities, and decisions that they don't like. You know, we all know the deadly nature of sin. Again, look at Adam and Eve. But a lot of times, we're not even aware of sin's subtle sidekick, the excuse. Because excuses turn the seriousness of sin into a simple shoulder shrug. It was that woman you gave me. She made me do it. It was the serpent's fault. It was just a mistake because I was tired that night. No big deal. Not my fault. And just like that, we downgrade sin against God into something light, something meaningless, which is why excuses are one of Satan's most effective tools he uses against Christians. So let me ask you, have you ever made excuses for something that you knew you should do, but you just didn't want to? Do you ever catch yourself making excuses when things don't turn out like you thought they would? Or have you ever tried to explain away why you didn't, why you couldn't, why you shouldn't, or simply wouldn't do something? Isn't it funny how excuses are just that, excuses? Now, if you find yourself making excuses with your family, your employer, school, etc., I encourage you to not only recognize that you're doing so, but stop it in those areas of your life. But tonight, I specifically want to talk about the excuses we make in our walk with the Lord. And maybe we don't even realize that we're doing it at that moment, but hopefully tonight will awaken you and me to be more vigilant to how we respond when he calls us, when he tells us to do something, and when he corrects us. And hopefully after tonight, we can keep guard over our hearts and our mouths to make sure excuses are kept out of the picture. Amen? Because God wants to be number one in our lives. He wants his word to be the main influence in our lives. He wants the Sabbath to be dedicated to him. He wants our worship to be directed to him, only him. And he wants our money to honor him first. God wants to have a relationship with us. And he wants that relationship to be the most important. But too often we make up excuses. I'm too busy to pray. I don't read the Bible because I don't really understand it. If I was making more money, then I could afford to tithe. I can't teach. I'm bad with words. I can't speak in front of people. I really should go to church this Sunday, but I haven't had any time to spend with my family this week. Now, these may sound like legit reasons, but remember what we said an excuse is. An excuse is the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. So these may look legit, but at the heart of them, they're lies. Because in reality, the ultimate truth is, you, don't, you just don't want to do it. You just don't want to do it. Stop making excuses. It doesn't matter how legitimate the excuse is, they help nothing and hold us back from everything. Let's see what God thinks about excuses. In Luke chapter 14, we find a parable that Jesus told. Let's read it. Luke 14, 15 through 20. Hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, what a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied with his story. A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, come, the banquet is ready. But they all began making excuses. One said, I have just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married so I can't come. <laughs> it's kind of funny. <clears throat> so the person who's hosting the banquet sends out the invitations to this amazing feast that's taking place. And based on how many people accepted the invite, they would start making preparations for the event. A lot like planning a party or a wedding today. You know, when Matt and I got married, after we got back all the invitations, we had to send a head count to the caterer with the number of people who said they would be attending. And whatever the number was, that's how many plates of food we had to pay for. 
regardless of whether they showed up or not. We had to pay. And this was also true of this banquet host. Because the people had accepted the invitation, he prepared food for them. He got everything ready, expecting them to attend. And when it was finally time for the banquet to begin, the host sent out his servant to tell the people he invited it was time for the banquet. And what he got in return were excuses. Not just excuses, but lame excuses. We find the first one in verse 18. One said, I've just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Verse 19, the other excuse. I've just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Again, another excuse. And what I want you to notice about these first two excuses is that they are both things that could have waited. This banquet was something that was happening once. It was something that possibly was never going to happen again. It was something special. But these things, these excuses that were being made, they could have been put off. The man could have gone and checked his field another day. The other man could have checked out his oxen another time, but they didn't. And the third excuse lies in verse 20. I just got married, so I can't come. So let me get this straight. You would rather go look at a field than go to a feast. You would rather go look at a bunch of probably stinky oxen than go to this banquet. And you're married and you can't make it. I know what y'all probably are thinking. It's his wife's fault. She probably didn't want to go, so he had to make up some kind of excuse. But... I I disagree because as a wife myself, I can attest to the fact that she probably would have enjoyed a night out and some free food. Thank you, women. Amen. Amen. So what could be more important in your life? Who turns down a feast for these things? These were excuses. And all these excuses did was reveal what was really in their hearts. They didn't want to come. They had something better to do with their time. God has invited you to spend time in his presence, to spend time in his word, and to spend time in fellowship. And like those invited guests, have you exchanged those things that God has planned for you for something that seems better or more important at the moment? The problem with the people in the story is that they had accepted that invitation, and they stood up the host. They left him hanging. Those commitments you make to pray, to read, to worship, and spend time with God. Remember them and honor them. God loves you, and he's looking forward to spending that time with you. You know, if we want to be all that God has called us to be, we have to stop coming up with so-called reasons why we can't do what God has asked us to do. We've got to stop telling him it's too hard or what if, Uh or I'm not qualified. Uh If we want to be used by God to advance his purpose here on earth, then we have to stop trying to justify our inactivity. Okay? And it's a lesson that Moses had to learn before God could use him in any significant way. You guys know the story. God told Moses to lead the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. But Moses had all kinds of reasons why he couldn't do that. Let's look at them. In Exodus chapter 3, we find Moses tending his sheep, minding his own business, when he comes across a bush that's on fire but not burning up. And God calls to Moses from that bush. And he shares with Moses his plan, how Moses was going to lead his people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now, being the great man of God that we know Moses to be. We would have expected him to say, no problem, I'll see you on the other side of the Red Sea. However, in response to God's call, we see Moses give excuse after excuse as to why he thought he was not the man for the job. And if we just take a closer look at the excuses Moses made, they're the same kind of excuses we make today. So let's look at them, okay? Moses' first excuse. We see it in Exodus 3, verse 11. Moses says, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? First excuse, who am I? That is a pitiful excuse. 
and it is a very common one. A lot of times when God calls us, this is often our first round excuse. It's loaded in the chamber, ready to fire at a moment's notice. Me? Who am I? Right? Anyone else besides me? Moses is saying, I can't do this. I'm a nobody. I'm a has-been. I'm, I'm old and wrinkly. I'm way past my prime. I'm just a shepherd over sheep. I'm not a leader of people. And then what about his past? Surely Moses thought about what he'd done back in Egypt to that guard. He was a murderer who had to flee from Egypt to save his own skin. So his past must have played a big part in him feeling disqualified. But you've heard the expression, God doesn't call the qualified, rather he qualifies the call. How many times has God called us to do something and we've handed him every excuse in the book not to do what he's asking, all because we feel we're unqualified? Mm -hmm. But did you know a lot of times God chooses the most unlikely candidates to fulfill his work? Think about it. Why would God choose an 80-year-old Hebrew exile to lead the Jewish people out of captivity? Why choose Peter, who some called a hothead, to lead the first Christian church? And why choose Paul, a murderer of Christians, to spread the word? To prove that it was really him at work and not man. It's the same God that's choosing you and me. He sees past the man or woman standing before him and he sees eternity. He sees our potential for good and how these broken vessels can be used to fulfill his purpose. So God sees something in Moses that Moses doesn't see in himself yet. And God's answer to Moses' first excuse was simple and direct. Verse 12, he said, I will certainly be with you. I will certainly be with you. God is giving Moses assurance. Yes, Moses, you are the right guy for the assignment. I know you fled from Egypt, but I'm calling you. I want you, Moses. Are you up for the challenge, Moses? I know you have a past. I know you're past your prime. I know all these things about you, but I will personally be with you. See, it really doesn't matter who you are or who I am. All that matters is he's with us. Isaiah 41.10. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. You see, there was nothing special about the bush that was on fire but not burning up. It was God in the bush that made it special. So that who am I excuse didn't fly with God. So Moses moved on to the next one. His excuse number two, verse 13, But Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they'll ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? He's saying, what am I supposed to say? So Moses' first excuse was in reference to who he was. I can't do it because I'm nobody. The second excuse was in reference to what he knew. I, I can't do it because I don't know what to say. Just like in any situation, If we're told to relay a message to another person, we would want to know exactly what the message was. The best illustration I have for this is when my family and I go to a fast food drive-thru. My husband is usually driving, so therefore I am in the passenger seat. And because I'm usually the one who knows everything the kids want, I will tell the orders to my husband, who then tells it to the fast food worker which puts my husband trying to juggle two conversations at once. (laughs) Me telling him we need two chicken nugget meals, two cheeseburger meals, while dealing with a fast food worker on the other side saying, who wants to know if we want apple slices, if we need sweet and sour sauce, if a juice box is sufficient? It's extremely frustrating to be in the middle, which is why most of the time now, Matt will just lean back and let me shout the orders into the intercom. So in Moses' case, God was sending him to be the middleman. He was the one to relay the message. So Moses tried to wriggle his way out of it by saying that he didn't know what to say. 
But once again, God quickly responded with a simple answer. Verses 14 and 15. God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. I am who I am. God was sending Moses with his name. God was saying, there is nothing outside of me that determines my character. There is nothing making me what I am. I'm not in the process of becoming something I am. I am without beginning. I am without end. I am unchanging. I am sovereign, all-knowing, always present, and I'm all-powerful. And you tell them that. And if you finish reading the rest of chapter 3, God goes on to tell Moses how it will go. He tells him that he will bring the Israelites out of Egypt that he will make sure the Israelites listen to Moses and that Pharaoh will resist but will eventually give in and that he will give the people of Israel favor with the Egyptians and that they will not go out of Egypt Egypt empty-handed. Now Moses had no excuse. He knew what to say. And the same goes with us because another excuse we like to use with God is sometimes when we may be asked to share the gospel. I don't know what to say. We act like we have no clue what salvation is and how we received it. But we do because we've been saved by grace through faith. We know who God is by reading his word. We know what God did for us because we've experienced it ourselves. And we know how God saves because we know the price Jesus paid to save us. So if the only excuse we can muster up is that we don't know what to say, God's got a few responses for you. First, study his word and be ready with what to say and what to share. 1 Peter 3, 15. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Second, trust him to speak through you. Mark 13, 11. But when you are arrested and stand trial, don't worry in advance about what to say. Just say what God tells you at that time. For it is not you who will be speaking, but the Holy Spirit. And most important, just like Moses was to tell them who God is, we're called to do the exact same. If you don't know what to say, do the simplest thing. Tell them who Jesus is. Not knowing what to say is not an excuse that we have. So God's response, although a good one, is still not doing it for Moses. So he comes up with another excuse. Number three. His excuse was, how will they know you sent me? Exodus 4, 1 through 9. But Moses protested again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked him, what's what's that in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw down the staff, and it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back. Then the Lord told him, reach out and grab its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it, and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Perform this sign, the Lord told him. Then they will believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob really has appeared to you. Then the Lord said to Moses, now put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out again, his hand was white as snow with a severe skin disease. Now put your hand back into your cloak, the Lord said. So Moses put his hand back in, and when he took it out again, it was as healthy as the rest of his body. The Lord said to Moses, if they do not believe you and are not convinced by the first miraculous sign, they will be convinced by the second sign. And if they don't believe you or listen to you even after these two signs, Then take some water from the Nile River and pour it out on the dry ground. When you do, the water from the Nile will turn to blood on the ground. So God has just told Moses that the people of Israel would listen to him. Remember back in chapter 3, he went over all with Moses what was going to happen and that they were going to be free and Pharaoh wouldn't listen, but eventually he would. And then Moses again says, what if they don't listen to me? 
So God has just told Moses the people of Israel would listen to him. And Moses says, but what if they don't listen to me or believe me? You know what I would have said to Moses? I would have said something like, Moses, weren't you listening? I just told you that the people of Israel will listen to you. Are you calling me a liar, Moses? It sure sounds like you are, but that's just me. <laughs> Do you think that maybe Satan was nearby whispering in Moses' ear? Like, did God really say? Because that's sort of how all sin begins. We question whether, whether or whether or not God really said what he said. Did God really say you can't eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Did God really say the wages of sin is death? Did God really say that Jesus is the only way? But luckily for Moses and for us, God is patient and merciful. And instead of sending a whale to swallow Moses up and keep him in his belly for three days and nights like Jonah, God gives Moses a couple of demonstrations where he shows his power to Moses. He turns his hand leprous, and he turns his staff into a serpent and back into a staff. And then if they questioned him, all he would have to do is show sign after sign, and that would validate God's calling on him. He had no excuse here. And we can find ourselves making the same excuse sometimes. You know, what if they want proof, God? It's pretty simple. As they say, the proof is in the pudding. You live showing God's work in your life. To think that God took you and me out of the muck that we were so stuck in and pulled us out into his glorious kingdom, that alone is a miracle. To think that God could take people who are immoral, greedy, conniving all other wicked things and make them pure and right before him and before the world, that is a miracle. Like Moses, we have the opportunity to show the world the power of God by showing them what he's done for us. Amen. There is no greater witness, no greater uh, proof, no greater evidence of God calling you than you living your life for him. Amen. What draws people away from God is not a lack of evidence, but a lack of Christians truly living out their lives for him. Right. We need to do that and display his power before we even speak. Yep. So once again, Moses, he, that excuse bit the dust, and he, he had to move on to the next one. And the last one, excuse number four Moses had, verses 10 and through 12. Moses pleaded with the Lord, Oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now. Even though you've spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. Then the Lord asked Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak? Hear or do not hear? See or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will be with you as you speak and I will instruct you in what to say. Amen. Moses' last effort excuse was, how can I speak? I don't have that skill. Moses had tried everything in his arsenal, from not being a person worthy enough to speak, to not knowing what to say, to not being able to prove that he was sent by God. Now he was left with his last chance. I cannot do it because I'm not capable of this task. And God didn't waste any time with this excuse. God said to Moses, I made you. I made everything. I know if you're capable of doing it or not, and I will be with you to do it. God wouldn't allow Moses to hide behind this petty excuse. God knew everything about Moses. He formed him in his mother's womb. He planned for his life even before he was conceived. God knew what Moses was and wasn't capable of. And even if Moses was not an amazing speaker, God gave him no wiggle room. He said, I'll be your mouth and teach you what you shall say. God would be the speaker, not Moses. All Moses needed to do was obey. So like Moses, many of us have also tried this excuse with God. I'm not capable of doing what you called me to do. To which I say, God answers, I'm God, I made you. I know what you're capable of. And even if you don't have that skill set, I'll fill that part in for you. That's right. 
Who are we to think that we know more than the God of the universe about ourselves? You know, some people say no one knows you better than yourself. But that statement is completely wrong because God knows you better. Amen. He knows all the ins and outs of you. And if you follow and obey him, he will show you parts of you that you never dreamed could have been in there. Yeah. God can do some amazing things if we will just let him be God in our lives. Yeah. So in the end of this whole conversation between God and Moses, Moses was left with one choice, obedience or disobedience. And surprisingly, even after all of God's rebuttals, Moses still answered with the stubbornness like Jonah had. Exodus 4.13. Lord, please send someone else. He had no more excuses. All Moses could do was come to the conclusion of the matter. I don't want to do it, so I won't. Instead of obeying God wholeheartedly, he would rather go reluctantly, having Aaron do the speaking instead of him. And this choice made God angry, but God never gave up on Moses. He continued to use him. And you know the end of the story. Eventually, Moses, being a will willing servant, led the people of Israel to the promised land. <clears throat> so where are you trusting in your own ability rather than relying on the supernatural ability of God in you to accomplish the task you've been given. What excuses have you offered to God for why you can't obey him in what he's called you to do? Where have you run out of excuses and finally thrown in the towel saying, God, I just don't want to choose someone else? Listen, a few years back when Pastor Bill first told me to get ready because I would be preaching, I could have written a book on all the excuses I tried to come up with in order to not be up here. <laughs> Who am I to be up here preaching? What if I say something wrong? I have four kids. I don't have time to prepare a message. There are so many more people who know way more about the Bible than I do. Excuse, 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 excuse. But I've learned that when I lean on the Lord, when I let him do the speaking for me, when I understand that he's here with me, those excuses seem silly. Amen. I never want to get to the point where God calls me to do something, and I make so many excuses that God finally says, okay, I hear you, I'll get someone else to do it. Yeah. Ouch. Remember that parable of the banquet that we read earlier? Well, there's more that happened. Let's read it. Luke 14, 21 through 24. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, Go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, There's still room for more. So his master said, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. For none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. When those invited guests made excuses not to be there, the host sent his servant out to go find anyone else who would be willing to accept that invitation. When those who were first invited claimed to have better things to do, the host found people who considered it an honor to not only be invited, yeah. but to come and join him at this feast. Yeah. The banquet was ready, and he needed people to fill the house. Mm -hmm. My heart's desire is to be at that banquet. Yeah. I am RSVPing. I will be there. Mm -hmm. Whether it's convenient or not, Amen. whether I think I'm worthy or not, mm -hmm. no more excuses. So have you been telling God all the reasons you can't do what he's called you to do. Has your response been, yes, but, or yes, Lord? We need to get our eyes off of our insufficiencies and put them on his all-sufficiency. You might as well make up your mind tonight that excuses are a thing of the past. Because from what we've gone over tonight, it seems that regardless of the excuses that we can come up with, God always has an answer. 
So here's the bottom line. If you've missed any, everything else, then get this. God wants to use you. He's saved you by his grace, and he has made something out of your life. Now he wants to use you to reach a lost and dying world. And the best thing you and I can do is to throw out the, throw the excuses down and realize that God is able where we are not. Our heart's desire should be and must be to serve him at all costs, regardless of what he asks of our lives. After all, he gave his all. So he expects no less from us. So are you willing to come to him tonight? Throw away the excuses. Are you willing to say, God, here I am. Send me, like Isaiah did. He desires our obedience, even when the task in front of us looks impossible, overwhelming, uncomfortable. In order to follow him, we must learn to trust that he will give us the ability to accomplish the task he's called us to. Ephesians 3.20, now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish more than we might ask or think. Maybe your business has taken over your life and you have no time for God. What's your excuse? Maybe you haven't cracked open your Bible in a while. What's your excuse? Maybe you're holding on to a grudge and just won't forgive someone. What's your excuse? Maybe all the praying you ever do is here at church. What's your excuse? Maybe you've decided not to tithe. What's your excuse? Maybe you're living like a Christian on Sundays and Wednesdays, but not any other day. What is your excuse? With anything in life, if it's not important to you, you will find an excuse not to do it. But if it is important to you, you will find a way to make it happen. Right, it's time to stop hiding behind the excuses we're so good at making. It's time to stop resisting and start following. Amen. If we're ever going to experience real life change, we have to lose the excuses. Uh -huh. There's no such thing as a good excuse because excuses don't strengthen your life. They weaken it. That's right. Amen. Amen. So, Father, Lord, I thank you for your word tonight, Father. I thank you that you're so good to us, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you knew us before we were born, Father, that you know our ins and outs, Lord. You know what we're capable of, Father, and you see us as vessels to be used. Lord, we are saying tonight, here we are, send us. Father, no more excuses. No more excuses when you call us, Lord. We are here and ready. Thank you. Thank you for choosing us, Lord. Thank you for calling us. Father, I pray that you be with each person in this room, every person watching, Lord. Father, that you would protect them and guide them through this week, Lord. We thank you for your ever-present, Lord, and your love that surpasses anything we could imagine. You're so good to us, Father, and we give you all the praise for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.